Part 1. There a discussion between a college receptionist, Denise, and a student named Vijay about learning a language. In the first part of the discussion, they are talking about the course VJ will study. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello. May I help you? Hello. Uh, is this the right place for me to register to study foreign languages? Yes, it is. May I have your name, please? Vijay. My family name is Paresh. Vijay Paresh. OK. Do you have a telephone number? Yeah. 909 2467. Thank you. Now, which language would you like to learn? We offer French, Italian, Cantonese, Mandarin, Spanish, Portuguese. Uh, I'd like to learn Spanish, please. OK. Our classes are conducted in lots of different places. We have classrooms in the city and here in this building. What's this building called? This is building A. I work near here, so it'd be best to study in building A. What time do you want to come to lessons? They go on for three hours and they start at 10 a.m., 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. I wish I could come to the daytime lessons, but I can't. So 6 p.m., please. That's our most popular time, of course. Um, have you ever studied Spanish before? No, I haven't. We describe our classes by level and number. Your class is called Elementary 1. OK. Uh, when will classes start? Elementary 1 begins... Uh, just a minute. Uh, it begins on August 10. Great. Now what else do I have to do? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. I'm sorry, Vijay. What were you saying? I wanted to know what else I had to do. Oh, of course. Please go to the building on the other side of Smith Street. I want you to go to the reception area first. It's just inside the door on the left as you enter from Smith Street. Give them this form. OK. Do I pay my fees there? No, but the fees office is in the same building. Go past the escalators and you'll see a games shop. It's in the corner. The fees office is between the games shop and the toilets. Thanks. Uh, where can I buy books? The bookshop is opposite the lifts. It's right next to the entrance from Robert Street. Your offices are spread out. Not as badly as they used to be. By the way, we offer very competitive overseas travel rates to our students. Oh, I'd like to look into that. Of course. The travel agency is at the Smith Street end of the building, in the corner next to the insurance office. Thank you very much. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a podcast on Camber's theme park. Now you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Welcome to Canvas Park podcast. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little about the park and the amazing things we have to offer. We like to think that Canvas offers more than other theme parks. Like them, we have a variety of exciting rides for people of all ages. But Canvas. Also places strong emphasis on the educational experience for its visitors, not boring facts, but lots of interactive exhibits. Although it's mainly an outdoor experience, we do have some indoor activities if the weather gets too dreadful. The park's got a lovely, well-established feel, set in eighty acres of beautiful countryside. About three miles south of the tourist resort of Dulcester, the park was set up in 1997 by the Camber family, but then taken over by new owners in 2004, who have maintained the original vision of the Cambers. It has lots of old trees, hundreds of flower beds, and a gorgeous lake. Cambers. Has over forty-five different rides, exhibits, and arcades. All but one of these is free once you've paid your entrance fee. We charge a small fee for our newest ride to reduce the length of the queues. You don't pay anything for parking. A family ticket for a family of four works out at about eight pounds per person, which is amazing value. Full details of current prices. Are shown on our website, along with full details of rides, etc., and directions for getting to us. We also have a number of special offers. For example, if you live locally, why not join our Adventurers Club, which entitles you to fifty percent off ticket prices all year round, and a special lane for all rides and exhibits, which means you don't have to wait to get into any part of the park. See the offers tab on the website. We've recently added a number of new exhibits to the park, and we're particularly proud of our future farm zone, which houses over twenty different species of animals, from chipmunks to dairy cows. The emphasis is on getting near to the animals. All of them can be petted, and you can buy food for feeding the animals. Many of our younger visitors. Say that this is the high point of their visit. And speaking of food, don't let the animals have all the fun. We have a total of seven different catering outlets on the site. We're open ten to five thirty all year round, and cold drinks and snacks can be bought at any time during opening hours. And hot food is available most of the day in the Hungry Horse Cafe from eleven until five. Just half an hour before closing time. Now you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Now we want all our visitors to have an exciting time when they come to the park, but our first priority must be safety. Parents and guardians know their children's behaviour and capabilities, but here at the park, we have set certain conditions for each of the rides to ensure that all visitors get the maximum enjoyment out of the experience. And feel secure at all times. There are four major rides at the park. Our newest ride is the River Adventure, 
which is designed to reproduce the experience of white water rafting. No amount of protective clothing would make any difference, so only go on this ride if you're prepared to get wet. Children under eight can go on this ride, but all under 16s must have an adult with them. Not all of our rides are designed for thrills and spills. Our Jungle Gym roller coaster is a gentler version of the classic Loop the Loop, specially created for whole family enjoyment, from the smallest children to elderly grandparents, suitable for all levels of disability and health conditions. Carriages have comfortable seating for up to eight people with safety belts for each passenger, which must be worn at all times. Sit back and enjoy the scenery. One of the best established and most popular of Camber's rides is the massive swoop slide. Whiz down the polished vertical slide nine meters in height and scream to your heart's content. There are no age or height restrictions. Be careful, though. You must have on long trousers so you won't get any speed burns. And then there's the famous Zip Go-Kart Stadium with 16 carts, eight for single drivers and eight for kids preferring to ride along with mum, dad or carer. Take part in high-speed races in our specially designed Formula One-style carts but no bumping other carts, please. All riders must be above 1.2 metres because they have to be able to reach the pedals, even in the shared carts. Full details of all safety features are available on our website at www.canvaspark.com. So come and make a day of it at Canvas Theme Park. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a woman talking about a number of different beaches to a group of tourists. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Right, let's move on to the beaches here which are absolutely beautiful. You do have over a hundred to choose from. They're mostly sandy beaches and they vary from the largest which is two and a half kilometers long to tiny sandy coves but there are a few that I'd really recommend you to visit. So, looking at this pamphlet, first of all, there's Bandela Beach. This beach is one kilometre away from the old fishing village of Bandela, which is a beautiful spot. If you park in the car park behind it, there's a small path which leads down to the bay. It's very pretty because the whole beach is backed by pine trees, so it's very sheltered. The beach itself is very clean and the water is shallow and safe. That, together with the soft sand, make it an ideal beach for children and non-swimmers. Um, a little further round the coast, again to the east, in the eastern corner of the island, is the spectacular Dapolata Beach, which is basically a long inlet. The land around this beach is marshland. It's all marsh. And there's a stream which winds through it and the stream goes into the sea and the beach has lovely pale gold sand. 
access to this beach is quite tricky and not for the less energetic. You have to go down a long flight of steps, 190 to be exact. But you'll be relieved to know that there's also a road which winds down to a car parking area. When you're level with the sea, there is a handful of shops and bars and you can hire some beds and umbrellas. Continuing round the island, just past the tip of Calne, is the next beach I'd suggest you visit and this is San Get. Why? Because there isn't a beach longer than this on the island. If you want to know, it's exactly two and a half kilometres long and that's a bonus because it means it never gets overcrowded. It has golden sand and clear blue water shelving into the sea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. It has golden sand and clear blue water shelving into the sea. There are several beach restaurants to choose from and water sports are available when the water is calm. But check first. This beach operates a flag system as the sea can get rough and you should always swim between the flags. There's a large car park which gives you easy access to the eastern end of the beach but the western end is much quieter and more wild as it is harder to reach. Blanaka is another popular beach just in the northwest corner of the island. It has incredibly white sand and sparkling water. There is ample car parking here and plenty of bars and restaurants. Blanaka has white cliffs all around it and for those of you who'd like a little more to do than just lazing on the beach, there are caves here which you can explore in the cliffs and you can also dive into the water from rock platforms along the side of the cove. Well, my final recommendation for today is Dissidor. Now, this beach isn't quite as easy to get to as the others I've talked about. It's quite a remote little beach, tucked away here next to Blanaka. You can reach Dissidor by a steep slope which goes over some sandbanks. The beach itself is small and pretty, with reddish coloured sand and some stony areas on its eastern side. Despite being quite small, the bathing is good, and you can also go fishing here from the rocks at either side. It's a good idea to take some food and drink with you if you decide to go here, as there's only one little bar which isn't always open. So, that should give you plenty of ideas to choose from over the next two weeks. And if you have any further questions... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a place called Kuba Pedi. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Good afternoon. Today, we're continuing this series of talks on the development of the Australian outback with a look at Coober Pedy, the desert town of opal mines and underground living, 
which lies 860 kilometres north of Adelaide and 690 south of Alice Springs. The inaccessibility, harsh climate and almost total lack of water made it a highly unlikely place for human habitation. But that all started to change in 1915 with the discovery there of opals, the precious stones which seemed to change colour according to their surroundings. Settlements were established following the First World War when soldiers returning from the trenches of France brought with them the techniques of living below ground in dugouts. The depression of the 1920s and 30s led to many prospectors leaving, but the town boomed again in the late 1940s when shallow new opal fields were discovered and immigrants from Europe arrived in large numbers after the Second World War. It must be remembered, though, just how hostile conditions were. Daytime summer temperatures reached well over 50 degrees centigrade, Winter nights were bitterly cold, and dense dust storms regularly blanketed the town. To cope with this, more and more people began living in disused mines and purpose-built subterranean houses, where the temperature remains at a comfortable 25 degrees all year round, so that eventually around 70% of the town's inhabitants had made their homes beneath the surface. This led to the construction of hotels and even churches below ground, as well as an entire underground shopping centre, the only one in the world. Now answer questions 37 to 40. Perhaps not surprisingly, this has now led to the emergence of a secondary industry, tourism. Increasing numbers of visitors come to see the tunnels and the caves with their ventilation shafts, the weird machines lying about in the town, and just beyond it in the scorched red desert, the conical hills thrown up by the world's biggest opal mines. It's a logical stopping place for travellers too. The nearest town to Cooper Pedy is Woomera, in the prohibited area once used for launching space rockets. But even that is an enormous distance away. Within the town itself, there are plenty of hotel rooms and a number of ethnic restaurants. Remember that Cooper Pedy is one of the most multicultural places in Australia, with an estimated 45 nationalities represented and its very own Opal Museum. A short distance from town, there's a section of the enormous barrier that runs thousands of kilometres across the country. The Dingo Fence, which is meant to keep these predatory wild dogs out of the sheep farming areas. Another attraction just outside town are the sets of various films made there, including Mad Max 3, as well as The Red Planet, and Until the End of the World, names that reflect the harshness of the terrain and temperatures there. The name Kuba Pedi, incidentally, comes from an Aboriginal expression meaning white man's hole in the ground. Next, I'd like to go on to talk about Broken Hill, another mining town, but one that... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.